On today's special edition of World Insight, she, the faces many can't forget. My vision was to see everybody in school. Of strength and determination. And planting a seed in their heart and making one day, and one day it will grow. Of power and persuasion. In that one moment, we communicated with each other in a language that surely predates human words. The voices of women, the forces of change. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. On October the 1st, the United Nations holds a high-level meeting on the 25th anniversary of the 4th Women's Conference in Beijing. The outcome of the 1995 conference, the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action remains the key global agenda for gender equity. Despite challenges in the last quarter century, committed nations have shown that change is possible. But progress for women in many areas has been unacceptably slow. Worse, the COVID-19 pandemic threatens to reverse many of the hard-won advances. More action is needed. So today, we bring you a special edition of conversation I had over the years with women who devoted their lives to change this world. First, let's meet her, Malala, many people called her first name, an ordinary Pakistani girl who won respect and admiration around the world. When the Taliban took control of her hometown in Pakistan, she spoke out, refused to be silenced, and fought for her right to an education. The UN declared Malala Day in her honor, and Time magazine named her one of the most influential people in the world. At the age of 17, she was already announced as co-recipient of the 2014 Nobel Peace Prize for her struggle against the suppression of children and the youth and for championing their right to education. Our conversation is her first interview with Chinese media. Malala talked about her plans to help female dropouts around the world to return to school. She also shared how she was forced out of school, something she hoped no other girls in the world like her have to endure. Take a listen. Malala, welcome to CGTN. Thank you so much. It's an honor. Wonderful to see you finally. Now your life has changed mm -hmm. from nobody knows to everybody knows. <laughs> That's a huge transition. How do you see this transition? To me, I'm just the old Malala as I was before. <laughs> the world might know me or not, but I haven't changed. I'm just still the Okay, same. so you have a few attitudes. What is that the norm, Malala? It's, how do I describe myself? I don't know, just like, I, I am an activist for girls education and for women's empowerment. I'm a sister, I'm a daughter, uh, I have a family, I have friends, and, and I'm just part of this world where I want a better world for everyone. Mm. And I'm focusing especially on girls, and, uh, and I hope that people and girls in China, in other countries are, I know that they're following my story, but mm. I also hope that uh, they, they also stand up for their rights and, and speak out. So I'm focused on the education of all girls all around the world. And there are more than 130 million girls who are out of school. So I have been making trips to Nigeria, to Mexico, to Lebanon, to Jordan, and I have been tra traveling around the world to make sure that we can reach out to all girls who are out of school. And uh, so even though I, am, I have been away from Pakistan, unfortunately, and I want to go back, but it has not stopped me from my uh, fight for education, mm -hmm. and I continue my, my work. Before, it's about you, Malala, that you fight a cause on your own, but now you have to work with everybody, bring in all the players, governments, businesses, and different societies with different cultures. How is that likely to be done? What have you learned? Yes, I have good experience in working with all these sectors from government to business to uh, NGOs to then working in, on ground and meeting young girls and activists. And I think the important thing is that we all have to work together. Mm. It's not the job of one person or one community. Mm. Business people, they have expertise, they have, they have science, they have skills that they need to invest in, a, in girls' education and their empowerment. Government also need to change their policies. Mm. They need to increase their funding towards 
uh, girls' education um, NGOs, they also need to come together and, and exchange and share what they have learned and how yes. they can improve their work. And also we need to go and reach out to young girls and, and support them uh, in, their, uh, in their empowerment and also that they can get quality education. Mm -hmm. Determined to continue her campaign for girls' education, Malala and Zia Udin set up the Malala Fund in 2013. The organization champions every girl's right to 12 years of free, safe, quality education. They believe girls are the best investment in securing peace and prosperity in the world. The Malala Fund works in regions where most girls miss out on secondary education, such as Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, Nigeria, and countries housing Syrian refugees. Over the years, Malala has met with girls around the world carrying her message of girls' education and equality. When I heard her story, I hoped to be like her, or at least do a little of what she was able to do. So I started Malala uh, Fund five years ago, and my vision was to see every girl in school. Yeah. Simple. All girls in school, whether the girls are in China or India or in Mexico or in Africa, everywhere we want to see girls getting quality education because when we empower girls, they become empowered women and then they contribute to the economy, mm. then they contribute to the society. So um, right now we are focusing on empowering uh, local advocates, local champions uh, in their work for education. So for example, in Afghanistan, uh, we are supporting a project where they are training female teachers so that girls can go to school where there are female teachers yes. rather than male teachers. In, uh, in Lebanon, we are supporting e-learning skills, we are supporting uh, making sure that girls can have access to STEM skills as well. So we are looking at area, what the problem is and how can we address the problem, how can we solve that problem right. so that girls can have access to quality education. But then the question is how, isn't that? So we are supporting local, local partners, we are giving them grants, we are giving them support, mm. we are also uh, helping them in their advocacy, so we yeah. are doing advocacy in the countries, we are doing advocacy globally as Have well. Have you met some of the girls that your cause is supporting? Definitely. Uh, just Tell a me week about ago. them. So just a week ago I was in Lebanon yeah. and I visited one of my projects that we are supporting and we were in this room of 12 girls and they were all Syrian refugees and I asked those girls what their dreams were and one girl said she wants to become an architect and when I asked why she said uh, she decided to become an architect because on the day mm. when she left her country Syria she saw her country devastated and destroyed and that day she decided that one day she will become an architect so she can rebuild her country. Mm -hmm. So now girls like her are receiving education, they're, they're receiving education mm. through, um, through digital learning, so we are making it easier for them to have quality education. I am in touch with girls, I meet them, I visit these schools that we are supporting and it's just amazing to see how education can change the lives of girls. Mm. Education gives them hope. So I guess going there, meeting those girls, in a way also reminds you of your life in the past. Definitely when the girls were talking about how they saw wars and conflicts in their region and they had to leave their home, mm. it was not their choice. They had no other option mm. and it just reminded me of my time in South Valley when there was terrorism happening, when girls education was banned, when more than 400 schools were destroyed mm. and, uh, and we had to leave our valley for three months. And that feeling that when you don't know when you would go back to your home is the worst time of your life. Malala faced countless dangers in pursuit of her advocacy. Death threats against her were published in newspapers and slipped under her door. On Facebook, she received threats and fake profiles were created under her name. When none of this worked, a Taliban spokesman said they were forced to act. On October 9, 2012, a Taliban gunman shot her in the head, neck and shoulder while on a bus in an attempt to silence her. Even though she was seriously injured, she survived. She was in critical condition as she was transported to the UK for treatment. She had multiple surgeries and she went through months of rehabilitation. People in Pakistan and around the world prayed for her recovery. The 10 militants involved in her attack were sentenced to prison, but Malala said she had already forgiven them. To be honest, I don't think back. I don't think about those you people. You don't want to think back? Or I, don't, I don't want to think back. Or not necessary? It's, I think what's important is that you just look forward. And, uh, and I think I, I just wish that they can learn about uh, 
about humanity, they can learn about the true message of Islam, they can learn that uh, it is always wrong to harm anyone, and they learn the importance of education, that education is important for their daughters, for their sisters as well. And, and I had forgiven them long ago, and I still say I forgive them, and I just do not think back. You've forgiven them already? Yes. What does it take to forgive? It's just, um, when, when I was recovering from that attack, I think I, I became stronger, in, uh, and I realized that uh, I was standing up for a cause that was so important that, uh, that, I, that this was just a second life, and I dedicated this life to girls' education. I said, I will, I will just fight for education throughout my life now. So I actually, I just don't think back, and I don't think about uh, the attack, and I, um, I just feel like it just never happened. I just ignored for a second that it just never happened. Because it will make her more comfortable, or I think it's it's. Uh, I just I just look forward, never look back. Mm. And but then uh, when I go in a, and I meet girls in refugee camps, and when they tell me their stories, then it just reminds me of my past. So what are some of the things that you could share with us when it comes to the adjective you use, you know, be brave and be going out there, but it's only adjective. When it comes to actions, it's not easy. I know it's hard. I know it's <laughs> challenging. I, 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 would, I don't say it's easy, uh, but I think if you stop, then that's even harder. Mm. If you stop, because I, love that. I, I always say that some people ask me, like, why did you start speaking out? Like, it was hard, it was challenging. And I said it was even harder to live in that situation and not speak out. How could you live in terrorism? How could you live in a, in a place where there are these people with guns and targeting people, destroying schools and banning girls from education, banning women from going outside the houses? Like, how could you imagine your life for a second in that? And I thought I would risk, put my life at risk, but I'll speak out. Mm. Because I just cannot live in this situation. This is even worse. Mm. It's a great point, I yes. think. So women, if women want to see change, they have to speak out. And, and they, they have, have to stick to it. They have to stick to it and they have to be brave. And I really appreciate seeing these movements around the world when women are speaking out and raising their voice against mm. sexual harassment or um, speaking out about all the violence that they face. And uh, women have to be brave. But also we need changes in the law, uh, responsibility from the governments as well. So everyone has to play a role in this. It's not just one person's job, but I think women also have to stay brave and resilient. But you know, Malala, you know, many women will say, I respect you, Malala, but at the same time, I don't want to have a fighting life as you do. What would you say to those women? I think uh, ad advocacy and uh, campaigning does not really mean that you will come out on the streets every day. It's, it's the small steps that you take. For example, you make sure that your daughter is safe and protected and she gets safe and quality education. You make sure that you take care of your health. You make sure that you get equal pay as men. You make sure that you are not sexually harassed. Mm. You make sure that you have equal rights as anyone else. This is not activism that you are on the streets every day and you are, I don't know, doing protests. That is also important at some point, but I think uh, the activism that I talk about, the chain that I want to talk about, is the everyday things that you do. What do you teach your children? Mm. What do you teach your friends? How do you interact? Um, and and, and uh, when, there's, when you see that there is some kind of discrimination happening against women, do you speak out or not? I can tell you have a lot in your mind and a lot of work to do. Hopefully we could all join you. So thank you so much for joining us and all the best. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank Anana. you so much. Next, let's focus on how women are fighting against poverty. In 2015, the UN began pursuing the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 points for a sustainable future to be carried out until 2030. Those goals meet global challenges such as inequality, climate change, environmental degradation, and peace. But the top goal is to end absolute poverty. For its part, China is working on a moderately prosperous society and eradicate extreme poverty. More than 850 million people, Chinese, have got out of the poverty, contributing 70 percent to poverty reduction efforts worldwide. But it is not an easy job, not 
at all. Each of them has a story to tell, and everyone has different reasons why they live in the poorest parts of the country. That's why we travel to the interiors of China, the southern part of Gansu province, to meet with some of them and hear how hard they are struggling to overcome challenges to their quality of life. Listen in as I get up close and personal with young student Xue Lan and her volunteer teacher Yu Qing from Baihe County in China's Gansu province. Tell their stories of struggles and certainly triumphs in fighting poverty. <laughs> Chi 有时候就我的这个爷爷在家里歇着就是他那个病嗯要注意些我和我的大爷爷就劝嗯听说你学习不错爷爷学连学习怎么样他不好意思讲学习还好真的啊知道跟我说两句英语嘛 What's your name? My name is Pao Xuelian. How old are you? I'm twelve. 好，说的不错。公鸡都打鸣了，给你祝贺呢。<笑>上学，你觉得以后最希望做什么事情？嗯，我以后想考大学。为什么要考大学？嗯，因为考上大学，要是毕业了的话，就有工作做。以后我就嗯，挣钱养我的爷爷和他奶奶。雪莲特懂事儿哈。哎，他还想啊，大学读出来，呃，还想为国家也牺
They went to the same school, Baihe County Central Primary School. The next morning, after a few hours on the road, it was already noon before we finally reached the school gate. This is um, one of those typical primary schools in the interior of China. 1,000 students studying here, coming in six different levels and grades. And this is the noon time for them. I'm going to meet some of the teachers. Three young volunteers enrolled from all over China by a program called Teach for China. Among them, Yu Qing, a young woman who returned to China a year ago after finishing her graduate school with an American university. The last time I was in your class, I look around, everybody, maybe because the camera was in the <laughs> so diligent. I didn't expect that. Because I, you know, in a primary school classroom, <laughs> everyone would, would have their little mind go off a little bit from time to time. But it was quite amazing. These kids work really hard. Yeah. Most of them. Mm -hmm. Did they tell you why? Well, it may sound like showing off, but <laughs> I think they like my English class. Mm -hmm. That's what they wrote it's down. It's not showing off. I enjoyed it too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, you might think English is really far away from their life. But to be honest, to most of my students, English is their favorite subject. Mm, why? It's not that hard compared with math. <laughs> and um, they could feel the sense of achievement in learning English. Um, and because I'm always trying to bring happiness and joy to my classroom, I think they enjoy being here. Even though they would not, uh, concern, they're not concerned about why am I learning English if, I, if I'm not going to use it someday? But I think they are enjoying the process of learning, and that's very valuable to me. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's one thing. The other thing is, when I say heavy, is that on the one hand, you believe education is going to alleviate them out of poverty. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it is not you who is the only factor playing an impact in their lives. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of other factors as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a teacher, how do you react to that? Not in class, but you know, when you go back to your dorm, little room, just mm -hmm. inside the campus, how do you digest that every day? It's very hard. <laughs> um, but I always believe that I'm planting a seed in their heart, and maybe one day, I mean one day, it will grow, and it will bloom. It will grow to be a tall tree or whatever, but I believe that life is going to be beautiful, because I know what seed I am planting, and I believe that process. I know a lot of people are talking about poverty alleviation. Um, well, I think education is definitely part of the methods to do that. Um, although it will be a very long process because you cannot see how your, the seed that you plant grow in one day. It may be five years, it may be ten years, but I do believe that sometime, someday it will grow. Um, I know that they will encounter many challenges. Um, sometimes I ask myself, what will happen when they go to um, middle school? Will they still remember what, what I taught them in primary school? Will that work? Sometimes I question myself, but if there's still one opportunity that it could work, I would grab it and I would, I would not let myself, I would not l let myself just go and see that happen. So I'm glad to be part of it, mm -hmm. even though I'm, I might not be the one who will see that day, but I would be very grateful that I could, I could be part of it. You are here because you're part of the Teach for China program. Yes. And you volunteer to be in that program. Mm -hmm. It's mainly for young people to join, particularly those freshly graduated from universities, whether in China or mm -hmm. overseas, yeah. to join and teach in China's interior areas 
two years at least. Yeah, two year program. But once you're here, life is very different. <laughs> yeah. How did you adjust from the very beginning? It was hard. You know, I used to shower every day, but <laughs> it's definitely not possible here. Yeah. And um, here is solar energy, right? <laughs> yeah. Solar energy. Mm -hmm. yeah, it but depends, depends on the weather. On the weather. <laughs> <laughs> and um, here I have to share my very, already very small dorm room with another a teacher. Mm -hmm. And every, every, every part of my life is like brand new <laughs> at yeah. the beginning. Your hair was here. <laughs> yeah, it's here. here. <laughs> Beautiful hair. <laughs> but you never get it uh, cut? <laughs> well, the real reason is that I've never found a good place to get it cut. <laughs> so we just let it go. <laughs> it takes you hours, one day almost, to travel to really to the big cities, right? Mm -hmm. um, like, it's, it, it would take me three hours to get to the town. Mm -hmm let alone the city. Yeah, so just forget it. <laughs> Is that? Yeah. I think now I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying the environment. I mean, I'm familiar with my daily life now, so. How do you compare your life with your peers, let's just say, who graduated at the same time with you from St. Louis? Yeah, uh, I think I lose some of the life experiences that they could have, but I also gained more. They're probably in consulting firms or investment banking. Well, but they sleep less. <laughs> they worry more. <laughs> and I think I'm happier here. Uh, I don't have to worry about money. I don't have, I don't have to worry about the traffic or, um, or um, you know, just the city, <laughs> the city life. But your parents, I would assume, they were a little bit concerned <laughs> because to them, their generation, your age probably is the time to think about family life, but yeah. plan for the future. Yeah, I'm working on that. <laughs> I, I really am. <laughs> um, I think when I'm, when I am growing, my parents are growing too. They are being more understanding and supporting. They actually visited me last month. I think that's a signal of them accepting my life and my job. How did they like it? Well, they did not like every minute of the journey, but I think in the end they enjoyed that. What did they enjoy the most? And what do they dislike the most? I took them to the village where my students live, and they had lunch with my students at their home, and it was very sweet. Um, the parents, uh, the grandparents made noodles, the local food for my parents, and they were talking even though in different dialects, <laughs> but they were trying very hard. Um, they were really trying to understand each other, mm -hmm. and that's very cute actually. Mm. Yeah. It is, it sounds it, cute. It is. <laughs> you know, some people have been questioning about these possibilities or these methods, suggesting that one teacher stay with one school for two years. Mm -hmm. Time to adjust, getting along, getting into the situation, time to leave. So they argue whether it's about enriching the lives like teachers like you, rather than really enriching the lives on a consistent basis for the children here. On the other hand, there's also a difference between you and the local teachers. Mm -hmm. People also wonder whether that is fair or not. What do you think? Oh, I think I've never, I never wanted to let them feel inferior to whether me or other fascinating people in the city. I think I want them to be that person who they think is fascinating. So, um, well, I, I think I'm opening a window for them to let them know what the other, what the outer world looks like. You mean for the children? For the children. If they think that's fascinating, I would encourage them to pursue that. Why not? Why not give it a try? I mean, if you say that they don't have the access to uh, keep going, um, well, I say after I leave, other people will come and a lot of people will offer different resources for them and I would not let that opportunity go. I mean, I would not just stay here and do nothing. So I, I would still try. Mm -hmm. And um, the other question about the, the difference between me and the local teachers, I think um, we are here and we are teaching uh, the students in our way, and that's also an interaction between us and the local teachers. 
I think we are learning from each other. They have very good class managing skills and we have um, some new teaching methods and we are interacting as well and that's also a diversity to the school. I think a good school is a diverse school in the end. So yeah, that's how I perceive that. At the end of the day, do you think your students will enjoy better their lives than even you do? Well, I hope that. <laughs> and I believe most of them can feel the happiness that they could get from the learning and from being with us, being with teacher and being in school. And I want to give them the sense of achievement. And I think that could accompany them for a longer time. Welcome back. This is World Insight, and today we are focusing on women leaders. I'm Tian Wei. In a rapidly changing world, only a few can survive plunging attention spans, and even fewer can survive severe public scrutiny. Jane Goodall, however, is one of these rare people. Her story, along in the African forest, living side by side with chimpanzees, has spread far and wide. She made us realize the earth should not be dominated by people, but it's a home we need to share with all other creatures. This simple message is easily said than done. That's why Miss Goodall spends much of the year traveling around the world. Even now in her 80s, she continues to advocate, advocate, and advocate for conservation. Earlier, I had a chat with her before she reflected upon the past. She introduced me to a longtime travel companion of hers. I Friend. brought yeah, Mr. H is my traveling companion for 24 years. Oh my We've God. been together to 63 countries and he represents to me the indomitable human spirit because <laughs> the man who gave him to me went blind at 21, decided to become a magician, was told that was impossible if you were blind, but he's so good the children don't know he's blind, and then he'll say, uh, you know, I'm blind, but things may go wrong for you. Never give up, there's always a way forward. Does he know that Mr. H has been with you traveling oh, he does. everywhere? That's so sweet. Yeah. So Should we let Mr. Mr. H to rest a little bit? Yes, he can rest. Because he's traveling with a lot of... Yes, uh, he gets very tired. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever that is, whether chimpanzee or a human being, they all have their very different personalities. Absolutely. So, what exactly is this special relationship you had with Mr. David Greybeard, the well, chimpanzee? David Greybeard was the first chimpanzee who lost his fear of this peculiar white ape, which is what I was. They'd never seen a white <laughs> ape before. And so gradually, because he got used to me, I'd approach a group in the forest, and they were all ready to run as usual. And then they would see David sitting calmly, and they'd look from him to me and back. And I suppose they thought, well, she can't be so dangerous after all. So he really introduced me to his friends out in the forest. David was gentle. Really? He was a born leader, not because he was aggressive in getting to the top, but because he was so quick to reassure that the young ones would want to follow him, just because he was a good chap to be around. Did you try to communicate with him about that community that which you became part of? No, you can't. I never tried to communicate with them. On the other hand, on one occasion when I was following him through the forest, I thought I'd lost him, and then I, I came, I had to crawl through this tangle of vines and stuff, and he was sitting almost as though waiting for me, and so I sat down near him, and there was a ripe palm nut on the ground, so I held it towards him, and he turned away. He obviously didn't want it, so I put my hand closer, and he looked directly into my eyes, he took the nut, he dropped it, he didn't want it, but very gently squeezed my fingers. That's how chimpanzees reassure each other. So in that one moment, we communicated with each other in a language that surely predates human words. Have you ever seen him again once you left? 
he died before I left. I mean, I was at Gombe from 1960 to 1986. I was at, at, in the forest most of that time. And already David had, he disappeared during an epidemic of, of something like pneumonia. Are you a member of the community, you no. are thinking? Or you were a researcher whom they took as a member of the community? No. Have you drawn that line always clear, or it's actually very blurred? The line between us and them is very blurred. But I never tried to get into their community. I just wanted their trust so that they let me. It was like sitting, um, almost looking through a window. They trusted me. They knew I wasn't a member of their community. I didn't try and communicate with them. Um, but they didn't mind me wandering about. I wasn't harming them. And so I was able to learn the secrets of their lives. I think I learned about that as a child when I was up in my tree daydreaming, up as close to the birds as I could get, out with my dog, watching birds. We had a little wilderness near us. So out in the forest, I didn't really learn much about myself, but I did have opportunity to feel one with nature. And that was just a magical feeling. I think it comes close to Zen meditation. When you have a moment to yourself when you are visiting Gombe, what would you do? Well, I visit Gombe twice a year and I always go out in the forest and I always insist on one day when I'm out in the forest by myself to renew my spirit. It's, it's spiritual food for me to be out in that forest that I love so much. But what was it like for you as a researcher in the wild in Africa at that time? As I got to know the chimpanzees better and could sit with them for long hours and then they began to allow me to actually follow them, it was, it was a, a, the attainment of my childhood dream. It was very hard work. The country at Gombe is very hilly so there's a lot of climbing steep slopes and quite often losing the chimpanzees. We now have African field staff to help and they're really, really, really good at climbing up and down the, the steep slopes. But I did my best, was very often with chimpanzees all day. And I especially loved following mothers and their families and watching the development of infants and learning that there are good mothers and bad mothers, <laughs> just as there are in human society. What are good mothers and bad mothers acting like? Well, the good mother is protective, but not overprotective. She's affectionate, she's playful. Above all, most important, she's supportive. And she will run in to protect her child, even though she may get into trouble herself. And that was exactly like my mother. At the time when you were doing the research, there was also debate going on elsewhere in the world when you are bringing out some of the details of your research and observations. People are saying, well, it's not academic enough. Others are saying, well, she probably has different purposes when she went into the wild. There, are also, there were also others saying, well, you know, she's got just the opportunity that none of us could have access to. Therefore, she's got what she had. I was described as the geographic cover girl. That's how I was described. And I remember that title. Yes, she's, um, she's got there because, you know, she's not bad looking. And so her research is useless because she's too anthropomorphic. But you see, fortunately, I never wanted to be a scientist. When I went out to Gombe, I hadn't been to college. I didn't know what was going to happen. I saved up my money. I got to Africa. I had this luck, or whatever, of meeting Louis Leakey. And he's the one who gave me this opportunity to go and be with chimpanzees. So at that time, I didn't have another world. But after about two years, Louis wrote to me and said, I won't always be around to get money for you. You're going to have to get a degree. We don't have time to mess about with a BA. You're going to have to go straight for a PhD. Mm -hmm. I've got your place in Cambridge University wow. uh, I, I, to do a PhD in ethology. I didn't even know what ethology was. I'd never <laughs> been to college. So when I got there, 
I was a bit nervous, as you can probably imagine. And to be told by these professors that I'd done everything wrong, I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names, they should have had numbers, that would be scientific. I couldn't talk about them having personalities, minds capable of thought, and certainly not emotions, because those were unique to humans. But luckily, as a child, I had a teacher who taught me that for all their learning, these professors were completely wrong. And that teacher was my dog, my dog, Rusty. And you can't share your life in a meaningful way with a dog or a cat or a rabbit or a horse, I don't care what it is, and not know that of course animals have personalities, but thank goodness because chimpanzees are biologically so like us, I was able to break that, break that perception and help people, including science, to realize we are part of and not separated from the rest of the animal kingdom and we should treat the other animals with a lot more respect and understanding. Shall we focus our attention on one species for campaigns so that people pay attention to this species and the protection of it? Therefore, more attention will be paid to nature conservation. Or we need to spread our attention, our resources to more species and yet less focused when it comes to campaigns. I think the lucky thing is that different people are passionate about different <laughs> animals. And there's enough money out there and enough resources, and especially our young people, our roots mm. and shoots groups, high school, university, mm. they're actually doing an awful lot yeah. for particular animals. And you know, who are we to say this animal is more important than that? Mm. Fortunately for me, chimpanzees live in the rainforest like the orangutans and the gibbons mm -hmm. and if we protect the rainforest for the chimpanzee home we're protecting the home of hundreds and thousands of other species as well and that's always good and usually if you protect the habitat for this particular species you are helping many other species mm -hmm. as well the story of Jane Goodall that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, search our program, World Inside, that's the name. And also check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Pian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching.